Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So it's, it's my pleasure to, to introduce Alvaro Castanelli. Um, uh, Alvaro and I met in 2005, right, at SIGGRAPH. And then we did this uh, trip to Paris, no? yeah. to Laval, Laval. Laval. and uh, with Benko, and uh, had a good time there showing our stuff. Very interesting, lots of stories there. Anyway, so um, Avaro's work is uh, fascinating, and I also, actually, I think I saw your work before then. It was the, uh, your demo at Kai with the, oh, with laser. the laser. Yeah, oh. and it, that struck me as, as one of the most amazing demos I've ever seen, actually, and still to this day is remarkable. So I hope you'll show a little bit of that. Yeah, it's there, a new version. So you will have some live demo. Well, it's actually in this in the slide, this picture right here. You too. will put this um, because I need someone who's very like. A sure. And um, but he'll he'll talk about what what makes it unique and, and amazing and all that. But but just a few words about Navarro. Um, are you going to go over your background? Yes, there it is, right there, PhD in physics, and um, at University of Tokyo today, and he's visiting the lab uh, this week, and maybe we'll um, have him back again do some more work. So, thanks. Thank you. So, yeah, I had, an, as I was saying, like a complete introduction about why, why I've been doing like media arts and, and science, but yeah, basically when I start, I was, and I'm trying to, to all the address your, your kind of oscillation between art and science. I started working a lot on, yeah, laser physics. I was, I was doing like plasma physics and stuff like that, and also up to electronics. When I went to Japan, people were using technology, developing things with a very clear purpose, making it faster, like I was showing these kind of robots, things like that, without not really a clear purpose in mind, as you were saying yesterday, for the hell of, uh, of, of, of the, the yeah, and the hell of it. Oh, hell of it. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and that, that struck me, I mean, uh, this kind of intuition, this kind of vision of when you do something and you just start to see it, you know, with a different angle, a different perspective. It's beautiful, you don't understand exactly what it will be useful for. And then, yeah, basically, you, I couldn't publish this kind of result on, only in venu venues like uh, maybe E-Tech or Kai, maybe Art Tract and things like that. So I started thinking that, yeah, actually doing media art is a way of doing actually research, have a platform for having a lot of feedback in a completely non-controlled environment and um, well, basically, I consider myself an inventor. So I think many people maybe solve the problem. Of, I'm an artist, so I'm a scientist by saying that. I'm just like creating, and I need this feedback. You need feedback, so papers, whatever is feedback. So I'm a laser guy. <laughs> so uh, today, I'm not going to go on all these works because uh, I've been doing, and sometimes uh, they are interesting for me and maybe not for others. So just work talking about this latest areas I'm working, I'm still working, I'm still trying to work, which is like human computer interfaces. And you will see some of these works become like media art sometimes or like research, depending on the public only. And uh, something I call a proprioceptive interfaces, which is a kind of extension of the concept of tangibles, tangible uh, beads, tangible interfaces. I think it's more not just that you touch it, but you feel it with your fu full body. Um, then also, uh, I've been working a lot. Can you see very well? Because I see very well here, but the contrast doesn't seem very. I can't like shut these uh, lights off. Turn the light a little bit yeah. better. Yeah. <sighs> Interactive. Did it work? Yeah. So, yeah, red and black is not good. I've been told many times. <laughs> uh, so, mediate itself is the idea. I think that interfaces are not just something that, you know, I'm here and I will like control something. Actually, the interface <laughs> changes you. It becomes an extension of yourself. I mean, it completely modify what I am. So I've been working on this idea of alter, sensing, prosthetics, and I work with blind people, uh, and tactile feedback keeps coming in many of the works I'm doing. And then the thing that I'm really very excited lately, and that's also why I'm here, because I found like, uh, I try to, yeah, yesterday we, we click on the, your name because I always call you Benko, but I wanted to say like, 
Vior. I forgot. <laughs> How do you say that? Yes. yes. I'm not gonna make this any easier because it's it's kind of fun. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I was reading your papers. I mean, it's exactly what I'm. I'm I, tr I want to to talk about this here because I'm very interested on these ideas of what's a display, you know, in displays beyond the the flat surfaces and interactive displays. It's no longer a display. It's just not at least no longer something that just produces graphics. It's a full like user experience. So. Three topics here: like minimal display, the idea not projecting just like data, but something different, making it like capable of having input too, and um, very important, zero delay, zero mismatch, spatial augmented reality will be for me the future. So we're talking. So uh, the first thing, like about this proprioceptive and synesthetic interfaces. Synesthetic interfaces, I mean, like you you move, for instance, your body, and something. It's mapped onto that. That is not necessarily like moving some object, but moving some other like dimension or something. So, I will start by explaining about metaphors. Actually, can I do something? I have like um, a lot of information that I cannot read here. Now I'm okay. Yeah. So yeah. So I, I also, always, my everybody do that, but I work a lot on like the concept of have a kind of metaphor, some very powerful idea, and I try to make things that work on that. It's very tricky sometimes because a metaphor can somehow go against the real affordances of objects, and you're using real objects to make these interfaces. But it somehow frame a lot of work. So the metaphor here is about using space as a container for data, so volumetric data, uh, like MRI images, and uh, also some artworks. Like this is actually time-lapse photography you can explore by touching, putting this data on space in subtle ways by making it maybe two-dimensional image that moves in space by moving the screens, and uh, other things like that. I will sh show some examples. This is maybe the the first like artwork I did. It was a kind of cube that somehow contains inside a whole volume of the movie, and by pressing on different uh, part of the image, you will like be able to control like time uh, locally. So, just pressing here, and uh, in fact, you are cutting into this volume of, of uh, images and painting literally with time. So, there are two things that were like uh, nice intuitions, and it did work. The, idea, the first is like, of course, this idea of playing with time and breaking the simultaneity of the of, uh, on the on the on the image, and the other thing is about like having something that is tangible that you can really touch with your hand and somehow uh, have, as I said, that this kind of synesthetic experience. I'm moving something and I'm doing an action that is perfectly like uh, correlated, but it's not about space. So it was very intuitive, and uh, people were doing a lot of comments about how. Like, can we really touch a screen? At the time, it was, that was in 2004, the first time I tried that. And you can see, like, yeah, different generations, like all the mothers telling the child, do not touch the screen. And children don't care, just like go there and, and start to interact with the screen and pressing. Uh, so I, I start having this feedback, wow, it's very interesting. The, surf, the projection the surface where you project is actually the, the locks of attention, in fact. You know, it's not just a display. Is an interface on how to. So, just a quick question that was, for me was interesting is like, what really technology was really bringing to this uh, uh, kind of interactive cubism experiment, experiment? Because of course, it has been done a lot of time, like with digital photography, with argentic like photography. It's called a slit scan, right? So I think the point is like you you have this real time interaction. It brings the uh, possibility of being doing performance with that. So exploring, having a really very fast kind of feedback and improvising and exploring the data. And it's quite important. It's not just, you know, when you, when some like maybe painting, uh, pa painter was doing some work, like it needs like years of experiences to reach, the, you know, its own languages. Here, very quickly, you do things that looks very similar, maybe. I don't know, let you decide. But somehow, 
I was wondering, is this good or not? Because actually the, all these years of practice to reach a language, you know, it's like somehow disappeared. Now we are making this up very quickly. And now it's, you cannot really go beyond the aesthetic that machines like give you. So that's an important point I've been discovering. When you, you make all these things, you get trapped in something that looks always the same way. It's very difficult to break this. You need a lot of practice. So this little square here means like when it's orange, it means science. When it's green, it means like kind of art project. And this is I being like requested to by some companies. Here it was a, a J Park, it's a nuclear facility where they had like proton uh, images of uh, objects inside. And then instead of having time, you can see inside objects by having this tactile feedback or zooming here also other things so pressure related again it transform in something that is either like zooming either seeing inside objects and well you can go like for millions of strange things there was sculpting like volumes by pressing and starting playing all that so that's kind of fun but then paper we needed to publish and that's a paper it was for this one of the conferences i think you were also chair so can we really make this serious? Like, can we really sculpt like three-dimensional data or find things or controlling a CAD system very precisely? So, with my colleague, like uh, he's not here, he wanted to come. We developed this, which is a version much more um, precise of this Kronos projector flexible screen, not based just on some infrared light. If you have a technical question about how it works, I will, I will answer. The other one, the system was using some, something called vision chip and um, sh shape from shading. This is using like structural light in real time with lasers and things like that. So you have a very, very good precision. And then you can really manipulate like this, this um, uh, things behind the screen. And the metaphor somehow changed. The metaphor is that you have a volume behind the screen, which is virtual, and then the real world. And then the idea was, instead of having a, a mouse in which the mapping somehow must happen in the mind, this is a membrane, the screen is a membrane that so this, this, and this 3D axis doesn't change. I mean, it looks perfectly natural, so can maybe sculpt. I mean, you'll see, like, there's a moment in which we try to actually uh, do something like clay, uh, like, uh, the manipulation by having always passive feedback and passive feedback was somehow enough oh i didn't press the chronometer so my talk starts now <laughs> hmm. i have a question so maybe it's too early to ask so i saw no. one this you have Just a copy. you have a space then you manipulate the other one is you have a 2d then you have a time at the third dimension you manipulate yeah. do you have any work to joint space Plus time, then manipulate. I don't understand. So you, the, you, your uh, projector, it's, it's a 2D, it's a video cube, then with yeah. the time over there, you manipulate on that. This one is a 3D mm. the object, you manipulate on mm. that. So I wonder if you have a 3D object plus the time, you have projects like that, so then you allow the interaction with it. Like the thing you were doing, like with the 3D object yeah, that. My, my simple mention about that. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, I, I I would love to if we have X Y Z plus T, then you are able, able to create the interaction with that. That would be. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. I see. It's, okay, yeah. No, no, no. I'm, yeah, I didn't talk about that. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Well, I don't know how you will. Okay, that's very interesting. We will. Yeah, maybe something. You have a kind of sculpture, something you touch it and it goes to some state that was previous state or something. Using virtual reality, yeah, that, that's that's interesting. Yeah, probably. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we'll talk more later. About that. So yeah, but I've been trying to map many di different like spaces, like uh, different dimensions, like was time, space. I try also like maybe more like high-level cognitive like uh, uh, understanding of the image. If the image, for instance, if someone was like maybe sad, the face will maybe stop in time. So you can do, you can mix all this coordinated, but yeah, I understand what you say. Uh, another affordance that it's very interesting was given by the fact that you can like play on on a surface instead of just having some kind of linear control on tracks. So try this experiment for a performance at the Museum of Contemporary Art, like 64 channels of video with sound 
and you, by touching different places on the screen, you can control delay and, um, and uh, speed. And then it's like having a chorus of voices. If you touch here and here, the, the intersections will go faster. So it was, you have this visual reason that correlate with so sound. And there was a lot of interesting things to explore. Um, the result wasn't really interesting, but mm, yeah, the vo yeah, you were talking about the analysis. We were talking about this, yeah. And then, well, now a little more serious. Uh, I was thinking, you know, we have this kind of chrono screen. It's a flexible screen, and it acts as a controller, right? But the screen cannot be moved in space. So here, the idea was to colors are a little strange. Uh, the idea was to actually move the screen on space. The screen here is rigid. Some people have now done that like, with a flexible screen. But having this, this screen on space and making sense of the content by just like moving around, it was very intuitive. And I tried with, I, I had like a discussion with a radiologist that they say that somehow like could be maybe useful in the future because it's not precise enough, but still like it gives at least for students a very quick like understanding of how how these uh, different parts of the anatomy are, are placed. So I've been trying to do head tracking to make like a little window uh, fish tank effect on something that's mobile. So uh, there are some like markers that when you, you when you occlude them, you can like even be in tracking mode or slicing mode. And, and the idea is that it's a plexiglass screen, so um, everything is actually the little, it's a small little box with a projector and a camera and infrared light. So you don't need, so this, you see it's here, that's the whole thing. And um, you could, that's why I could like maybe detect like an infrared pen and also annotate in 3D. And uh, eventually <coughs> what I would like to be able to do is actually do like pinching all these functions with hands, with bare hands, I couldn't do it yet. And um, because what will be needed, it's maybe, of course, can be done maybe with a, I was going to say iPad, uh, a Microsoft Surface. But uh, the idea, it's like maybe, I like that it's any object can be used as a, as a display. And of course, if it were a little transparent, if it were maybe made of acrylic, because I'm putting the light from, down, maybe I can like couple the light inside the screen and it becomes an FTIR like interface. I can do all the things, but at the same time, the position of the screen somehow control the, um, the content. So there were some attempts to use this for a kind of performance in which the surface of the people were actually the screen intersecting some virtual objects and, uh, and having a kind of Boolean theater. Uh, and as, again, like putting these images on space. This is this is an ins art installation, like uh, mo mostly like mechanical. So they have some behavior that depends on where the people are on the on the room. But this elephant is always flat. But you start feeling some kind of three dimensionality as as you move because it feels space. It, it has some way of moving around that depends on the the shape of the animal. So. Uh, I was very interested in how you create the sense of uh, presence of these virtual objects uh, without using, you know, goggles or something that will like really actually show you this three-dimensional thing. And one thing that comes to to mind is like, well, tactile feedback again. So uh, the motivation for that is like sometimes you have like people, for instance, that do like actors in a in a, a chroma king like, setup. And they will collide, you know, they have the CG augmented stuff and they collide with these objects. So normally they have a screen and have to see themselves interacting with these objects. So the idea was to maybe feed them with uh, small vibrators in the joints. And then as they go, like move to, towards, like near some of these three dimensional objects, they will feel the, f the, the force fields. Uh, that's a very early prototype using like a ultrasound sensors, ultrasound like a custom-made ultrasound like a tracking system. Uh, that's 
here there will be a kind of virtual column we're changing the color here uh, and we, we thought about like using a different kind of cues like more subtle cues maybe changing temperature and things like that depending on the state of this virtual object so again like a question how to generate this sense of presence you don't need more than that I mean you're not really now exploring some 3D volume and you need very precise information but something is there or or nothing. So it's, it's sense of presence like beyond this idea of teleconferencing, seeing something or seeing something virtual with goggles. So that's the art part now. I was trying to create this sense of uh, uh, embodiment, of being somewhere, of being uh, some presence of, in this case, yourself somewhere else. It's a small experiment. I mean, I, as you see, like I'm going from like art things and like research, I don't know what's really interesting for you, not like just stop me and say like, yeah, this is crap, go, like tell me. But this is, for me, was very interesting when I start playing because it's really dis disconcerting, as I say, it's weird. Uh, actually, I made a little box with a stereo display, I put a display, it's custom made again, it's just two, two screens and some special optics to make it really 3D. So what happened is like, if you approach this box and look here, uh, you feel it, it's empty, or there is something inside. And if you talk, or you say, what's this? Actually, you get trapped, because there are two cameras behind you, <laughs> separated by 10 times the distance of your eyes, and the whole room looks exactly the bo like the box. My original idea was to make the box exactly, but they couldn't really close it. So it was just the corner. So what happened is that the whole space kept trapped inside, with some little time delay. This is a classic in, in video art since the 70s, delay. So what happened is that people, you see yourself, then you say, oh, wow, where is the camera? So you turn around, you see the camera, and then you look here and you look yourself, like looking at in your eyes. It's kind of scary. So at one moment, you don't know where you are, and people get really trapped, literally. They, that's why it's called boxy Lego. So there is a little sense of uh, um, disembodiment, where I am. So that idea started also to be a very a driving a lot of little experiments and research I did in the lab about where do we place <laughs> yes. where do we place our like uh, our self you know where are we in these kind of interfaces when you are like talking on Skype to someone else where are we okay we always somehow we know that okay I am in my head I mean it's what people will say but with all these interfaces with all virtual reality. What is the center of gravity? You need the center of gravity, otherwise you get lost. The sense of control, you know, where are we? Where is the, the, in, yeah, this? So, this started like, like this kind of piece, art piece, and then I start thinking, yeah, maybe this, maybe a, something that existed before that produced the same uncanny effect is a mirror. If you wake up in the middle of the night and you are a little sleepy and you go to the bathroom to get water. I remember once I did that, and uh, I was totally sleepy, and I look at myself, and I did like, ah, just, on, just like choking. I was so scared. It was, no, it was really, I had a kind of reaction, wow, I was like boom, 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 you know? There is something very interesting about mirrors, and we get, I mean, we don't have mirrors since long time. I read three books about mirrors. I get completely obsessed with that. How can it be that we are really not totally fascinated by mirrors. We put mirrors everywhere, and it's the most disturbing experience, you know? And we are now doing that. We are connecting cameras and putting it everywhere, and like, okay, so this center of gravity, the self, is being completely destroyed, so we need to reconstruct it through these interfaces. So that's what I call, like, interface for me is an extension of the self. It's a kind of, you are like manipulating that. You have to be clear where, we, what are you trying to do? So, uh, I was thinking that it could be maybe the future you know, super mirror, for instance. Yeah. For instance, a very simple application because this is orange. Could be this mirror in which you can see yourself from any side, or using the cameras everywhere in in the city to have the ability to just look around to any object. People have done do, do, done that on cars. This is uh, how you call that this AVR AVR system uh, AVS system that you can see your car from, as if you were looking at from top to park, right? So actually we work, now I can say it goes into a secret, but I work, we work with some uh, car company, 
company. I cannot say the name of the company. <laughs> I think you know which, which one. So the, the idea was to extend this concept by actually networking, you know, like the plate of the car to the camera where in front of the car. So for instance, it, it becomes invisible. You can look through cars. And uh, the idea was to, 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 to completely network all this using like tags. Here was our toolkit. So I just prototyped it with our toolkit and some like a uh, uh, wireless uh, ad hoc network. But normally you could uh, maybe do much more like connect like this. See, you know, you are in a jam, in a traffic jam, and you can see what, what's going on. Like you cannot see it, but just like, Start like clicking, clicking, clicking on the car, this car, this car, see what's there. So it's like your routine video. So it became interesting that, oh, this is a, it's another piece I will sh maybe show you if you had time, in which I tried to extend that concept on the whole earth, like connecting like plugs of video. Then you don't know where you end up. So it's more like an art project. So, ooh, uh, I think I'm very late, but anyway, uh, so, about these interfaces, more, more concrete now, not more concrete interfaces, not just about like vision, but I'm being trying on uh, extending what I would call like, or creating new sensory, sensory motor contingencies. That, that's really the much more classic work on uh, augmented perception. So creating, for instance, like X-ray, like vision or whatever, like we'll be extending senses. So very concretely, like the metaphor I've been exploring since a long time is this, this, this idea that, you know, we are relying all the time on vision. Vision is something that really appeared quite late in evolution, evolutionary terms. Before, animals like cells were con only concerned about what's really, really around them. You know, some millimeters, chemicals, something, centimeters. And we are extending this range. Vision extended very much. Now we are extending, maybe with internet, we know like something is happening like some million, some thousand of kilometers from here, but still it's not a physical, uh, very direct interaction. So the idea of extending the physical body with, with uh, like cilia, antennas, and things like that. So I explore that from, both from machines. So how, you know, you have like phones and people you now are playing by putting a camera here to be able to track hands. But you know, it's always a very short range interaction. So why not like having hairs, hairy kind of electronics? So, uh, and also for people that will be, so for people, I was well, uh, uh, interested about this idea of maybe we can have like this cilia, this extension of the, of the surface of the body through, through rays of light. So not obstructive. But they are actually rangefinder, and the feedback is, ta is tactile. You know about this work, right? So it's a new sensorial modality. It's not tactile to visual substitution system. It's a new sensorial modality. It's a new like a uh, uh, sensory motor uh, uh, loop because it's tactile. It's range to tactile. It's not vision to tactile. It's my body. It's much more like, like this attribution. My skin has been extended. I become very fat. And uh, well, that's just one of the first prototype I was just playing. I'm really not seeing, so I have only one module, and I start like actually moving a lot to try to find. You know, I just feel something. Mm -hmm. the, the the strength depends on the range, and um, and you start having a, a special kind of behavior. So, this is the theory behind all this kind of research. It's called like action in perception. That you, the perception is never passive, and then you start doing some kinds. I know I put this. This is my niece. Because that's how this project started. She had some eye problems. My, I worked during my PhD on artificial retina. In fact, kind of vision, optoelectronic processors for, for proce processing like, uh, processing like vi uh, data, visual data. But it's not really an artificial retina. And he said, like, maybe you can make that for my child. And uh, the first idea I had is this, like, it's not possible. You don't need that. You need. And then it became more serious. This is a real experiment with 50 blind people in Brazil. So here the headband uh, contains only six of these rangefinders. And you'll see that sometimes they, there's a little light there because they are actually feeling it. And they move, and they feel that there is something. Something that, I mean, uh, uh, she's uh, Professor Liana Sampaio. She was 
specialists on that who work with Buck uh, and Rita, you know, the first like experiment on putting on the back and, uh, and uh, she did a lot of trials, a lot of trials. When I, she sent me this video first, I was saying, no, this is not normal. He doesn't have the cane. It's so distressing. You, know, she, you can't feel that he's like this, he's scared. But he tried with cane and without cane. And this is a complement for the cane. It's not a substitute. But it worked pretty well, and they want to continue doing that. They want to, they want to have it as a product. Uh, <laughs> since then, that was 2006. And uh, there have been so many projects that are very similar. Uh, yesterday, I had to do, review two papers with presenting exactly the same thing. And they were reviewing projects with using Kinect. I don't see people having a Kinect on their head. I mean, unless, I'm sorry. Yeah, I see people having Kinect on the head, <laughs> on the on the shoulder. <laughs> no, but no, not the problem really here is like it must be super cheap, super invisible. So we thought at the end, uh, maybe at least for children, we could maybe just use some kind of plastic little antennas, because the problem with the child, she was telling something, telling me something terrible. When a child bo is born blind. They are scared about bumping their head like in front. So they start like, walking backwards. They start really always protecting their face. And if you start like your life walking backwards, I don't think it's very good. So very early uh, in life, you have to you know, make at least some very simple awareness of what's in front. So people put their hand, hands or, or maybe really having some plastic. Or, and that's the, ver the Japanese version. How I'm showing this for two reasons. First, because it's quite fun. And second, because everything we do in the lab, I mean, really, now 80% goes on TV because we become kind of well-known, Ishikawa Lab. So I was asked like to show this. And uh, it's interesting because the public gets, you know, we were talking about technology, how people perceive it in, in Japan in different countries. And it's always a joke. So I was really angry at first. And then I, maybe I got it, you know? It's, it's the only way, like, people get used to these things, to, to, to visions. You see, they don't read, people don't read the paper. So you see that and say, oh, that was kind of stupid. But it could be maybe used for a blind person. You know, it really goes the other way. <laughs> and they make very nice graphics, so I don't have to make myself. <laughs> well, I mean, it's a long video because uh, then there is a detective that put this and start like moving very well. But yeah, I have this. I could do my whole presentation with this kind of videos. <laughs> Question. So I noticed one of the videos, it's, it's like a paper ball. The other is... is yes. So how do you differentiate different quality of the picture? I mean, you definitely want to avoid that board. But maybe you can go through that paper ball. What kind of feedback can you want? Sensing and sensing. It's a delicate thing. I mean, I, we are writing a big paper now, a real paper. So I, mean, we, I will explain that later. There's a lot of things. Because it's not just a vibration, it's, a, it's tactons. We're trying to create a kind of tactile language. And uh, it depends, yeah. Sometimes the signal uh, goes to zero too quickly. It can be because of the surface is, is a corner. Or maybe somehow, I mean, it depends. It's, it's exactly like, it's a kind of very simple uh, optical processing. I mean, this is no camera, but you have all the effects of uh, yeah, reflectance of the surfaces. And you can couple with ultrasound sensor too, which have much bigger kind of, not range, but uh, uh, field of view. So we are trying to couple both of them. But yeah, what, so when we were doing this project, what we noticed is that the only way to see if the blind person, for instance, was really getting some feedback was to actually see these little LEDs. Then I made a prototype in which you send all the information to the computer, you see all this stuff. But I was very interested on in that idea. OK, I'm here, so you get close to me. You don't notice me. You get close to me, and then something flashes. So you do like, oh, sorry. I'm the one who's maybe looking at my phone, get too close to someone, and without even saying anything, I have some f feedback, you know? Not this feedback, which this is the, the haptic radar project but a feedback to the environment. I am here. It's like uh, lights on the car, you know? So I was trying to think about that, and I was start collaborating with an artist also in Australia about this project that was about extending the body in time and space through this really uh, geometrical like, lines. So we put like, a lot of lasers on people, 
actually dancers, professional dancers that dance with in the company of Foresight. So, and uh, we we'll just try to see what happens if you have a body that is extended and somehow interconnected because it has a lot of motors here. They could move like up, down. It's very, very short. And they move not because he's moving them, but because of the other guy, this partner, can move and they map, it's mapped onto, onto this body. So it's like you have an, an extended body and a shared body. That was really open, open kind of research. No, it's no at all like kind of very serious uh, research on that and was just what happened. So when w w the most interesting uh, result here was that uh, oh, I cannot believe like it's not working. This technology. This technology. Ah. It was that when you don't see the dancers, you see all the projections on the f building little lights and you see that something is moving here. So there is a kind of projection of, of motion. And another thing that, that was really pain, like, it, we, we really put a lot of LEDs on the vest and made a model of, a, of a, some kind of light substance that can go on the surface of your body, depending on how you move, like you will maybe rotate and do things like this, to extend it Temporarily, the motions, you know, if you run like this or you do like this, it starts like spinning around you. So the idea was try to make that effect like very strong, like visual kind of inertia, a kind of blur motion, like never th things stopped very clear. So we made many prototypes. And uh, so that's the first one. When I was not very fat. No, I kind of put, no, I really kind of put in. Uh, yeah, a lot. Uh, yeah. What I'm showing here, because I, for seeing the laser, you need some hazers, smoke, smoke machines. So this was how it was exhibited, a kind of big spiral with a lot of speakers. So there was these lasers when people will move. It was an, uh, a kind of, so dancers were inside, but it also works as a kind of public installation. So as you move, you, you, your motion was detected like the, like the um, elevator, like 3.0. So but much better, it works. No, sorry. Uh, when, it, when it detected your, your acceleration, it started like spinning sound because there were eight speakers. So you, there was flow of, of water going, a kind of spiral, you know? We were trying to bring this space, which is very, very kind of, uh, uh, urban the feeling of uh, nature, the power of nature. So this it was a big sound. And one week later, it was an earthquake. Oh. So yeah, it was a kind of, wow. We just invoked the power of nature. So yeah, not so fun. Well, I don't have a lot of time. So I really go quickly. That was played a lot of things like face vision and um, another video. Now this is BBC. You know, who knows her? But She's, a cat as uh, yeah. <laughs> it's it's uh, Joanna Lamley is uh, absolutely fabulous. This, she was Pat, Patsy Stone on one very one famous job, movie, I mean, uh, kind of program. She's, that, it's one of the gay Bond's girl. Nature, and she, she was making, yeah, sorry, don't look here. What is it? She was making a, promo, a pro, pro, uh, program about cats and how like cats have actually an extending body through the whiskers. So uh, how can I have this? So she, she, I mean, for her, this kind of strange mask. And uh, she, she's very polite in the video. She said, oh, that's interesting how, with a British accent, how cats can see. In fact, she was saying, fuck this, is awful. I will never do that again. I mean, it's really, no, it's because it's a terrible thing. You feel like Hannibal Lecter, and you feel a lot of vibration on your face, you know? Uh, so here I have all these kind of her vital signs. Because like everything is like a uh, sand like. The sound is very low. Perfect. That's okay. Good. Beautiful. So now I will just switch on the motors. See the British accent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. oh God, how oh, weird. Uh, yeah.
the mask is sending everything wirelessly to this computer. So up, try to approach your hand or, uh, yeah, over your mouse. So this is That's the sensor me. near your mouse. Oh, oh. This one. How can I try that? Well, we will try that on the corridor. Cats. Oh. A cat's whiskers are the most incredible bits of kit. So it's quite interesting, Tiny actually. So I learned things they can't even detect, like, well, air flow. And blind people can also detect air flow through this. It was this controversy. People thought they had six sense, like blind people. Actually, it was they were able to detect, like, it's called face vision. They do that? They do that? Yeah, yeah well, yeah, that, that was the idea. That's, at the end of this technology, exactly, exactly. Closest could have this kind of ability, you know, to feel like, yeah, yeah. very good point. Yeah. Here's, uh, I read a, a, an article by uh, the ACM, uh, I don't know, it was interesting. He, he, he went bold and he said, like, start like bumping my head like 10 times more. Because you feel when you're approaching something, it's more like a, Yes. <laughs> That's the only thing she said. <laughs> well, it's, it's long. So again, like more about this extension. I mean, I did a lot of experiments, and uh, now the idea is to decouple like sensors were on the car. We never tried in a real car, and um, but the actuator was on your forehead. So in fact, somehow. See, that's what I was saying. Some stimuli to the external world, even if this person doesn't know that this person is getting close, you have an advertisement. People don't do that now. People are always thinking, OK, I have to like, do something to tell the driver to take action. But these things could work in a kind of reflex arc, but never like, somehow get the brain of the machine like. Uh, aware, you know? The driver doesn't need to know that the car is taking some very low level actions. So that, that's how it looks, this thing. Uh, it was controlled with the eye closed, because you feel when you move the car that, that you are like having some pressure. And well, I don't know if it will be, it could be maybe used on a real car, I think. I don't have a driver license, and I sort of think that if I had a car, I would like to have that somehow. <laughs> no, it's true, like, because, you know, I, I, for me it's magic how people car park their cars. I don't know, I don't understand. <laughs> this is a sixth sense for me, so I need to build my own. <laughs> see, see, it's really, it's cap you're capable of doing a lot of things and stop and. You're not seeing. Ah, that's too easy. No. Oh. So yeah, one. Now let's go now to this more like the last point, the thing that really I'm very much interested in. This idea of uh, what's what's a display? What's really why we, why we are trying always to address somehow the, the neocortex, like when I'm sure all reading, you know, is occluding and so much data. So thinking about this. Ambient displays, all this is very fun. And, uh, but you need very precise, very concrete like cues. And uh, you cannot also be looking at the screen for having something that even is, if it's a simple cue, you have to read, to look there. You need to have these places that are, of course, ubiquitous. And they are also, the, 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 con the, the content is related to where they appear. So we'll show you some examples. This is something that could also be a kind of extension of the self. It's called the laser aura. Uh, the idea was like, you know, in Japan it doesn't express a lot in the office. But, um, but I was wondering, you know, I'm, I'm working, uh, or I want to know how, can I interrupt you or something like this? You know, like you, in social networks you always have like available, not available, something like this. But you don't, it doesn't happen anymore in, in the physical world. Why? Because we assume that if you are there, you can like, hey, Maybe no, maybe I don't, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, exactly. So the idea was to show something around the person, this kind of aura. 
And uh, the experiment here was very simple. Uh, we tried with some uh, uh, mind flex to, to try to measure some EEG signal that didn't really work, and then like arousal through skin conduction. At the end, it was just like uh, sensing the vibration of the chair because he was like stressed, like he's talking to me. So you have this kind of aura, right? And uh, the aura could be like this minimalist display could show a lot of things about social, like d distances, emotions, and uh, I want to go to the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> or objects. Like, where is my banana? <laughs> this is, I just show. Yeah. Uh, exactly, where's the key? So that's what, that, the comment that you read, did you read it? By uh, Bruce Sterling. Bruce Sterling is this famous like, uh, uh, science fiction writer. And he is actually commenting about this project, all these things. He, he started reading that and he, he gave me a lot of interesting feedback. And it's true, like, don't inflict major intervention on reality. A laser pointer, you know, it's so nice. Keep it always like, for hours and run out of battery. So then, what I say, minimal displays doesn't mean small, or by no means. So this is another experiment we did um, on, a, on a mountain in Finland. Actually, oh, what is the video? Just, okay, I want to show the video. Oh, ah, ah, close your eyes for uh, 30 seconds. Listen, to, oh, I know, I can't believe it. I don't have the video. Well, anyway, I don't have time either, so. Okay, so never mind, never mind. So, well, we tried to project like interactive graphics on, on, uh, on ski, um, ski, ski what? Ski, ski slope. Ski jo in Japanese, they always say ski jo. So here it was a kind of, uh, you can see that on YouTube. It's a seashore and people can play with the seashore. So we used two, two ways of tracking people and make this interactive it was like either like with a camera or using the laser sensing technology that I will show in a moment. Because the problem with all these kind of interactive displays, iconic, iconic displays, things like that, is like in particular for games and for, for really interacting with people as if there is something there that has intentionality that reacts to my actions. Then I, I believe like very much that you don't, you cannot afford having mismatch, spatial mismatch or time, like delay. So it's very important to have some key technology for that. And I think, of course, there are two two ways to do that. One is like uh, smart sensors. All these things have been developing. That will show an example. And the other is, of course, vision based, and uh, the technology will evolve, and um, it will, they will converge. So. Uh, but the goal for me, it's not really the goal, it's something that will happen, but it will change things radically and people will start thinking differently about that. So some project about the smart sensing technology with laser that I will show now very quickly. It's a book flipping printing or skin games and this idea of a robot made of light. You see how it goes, this idea of a robot made of light because of the display and the place where you display the graphics make is, is, is part of the message. You know, it's not that I have a display here, you can't put any information. What I'm projecting may, means something. It's like a person, you know, I'm talking, this person is saying something, it's not the other one. So I think that somehow it becomes a kind of a living being. That's also very similar to when I read your paper about like Bimatron. Bimatron? The idea that you are location based, like a display, it already has a lot of meaning. It doesn't care what you are projecting, it depends on where and how it reacts. So for the more like technically in inclined, let's say that, inclined? Okay, so I just a word about how this laser sensing display LSD technology works. Uh, you have like two or more like lasers that are completely collinear. One is for sensing and acts as a range finder. It's actually more, it could be also, could detect polarization, it could detect like, a lot of things like color, and the, and the other is for displaying the color. So that means that when you are like drawing here, for instance, here you have a normal projector. It's, you, it's not aware at all of what it's doing. It's like a blind projector. Here it's actually being able to sense the same way when you write 
or you do like calligraphy or whatever, you feel the surface. So that was a key point. You have something that actually feeling where it's uh, writing. But per pixel, it's not like, okay, I will write a full like, letter, I close and then I look, oh no, it was curved. And then I have to start again. That's actually vision based. Now it works and I have to scan for the surface. Is that right? No, I'm correct. So here is like each pixel, I know where I am. Oh, I'm not touching it anymore. I'm not at the right distance. I have to maybe pre warp or whatever. So the, te the technology works like this. It's just this idea of having a beam that can at the same time sense and uh, apply it for machines, gives you this, for instance, a ma what I call the markers less laser tracking. That was 2004 technology. So here you have like a galvanometers and one photo detector. So there's no, no imager here, just detecting the reflection by uh, doing some synchronous photo detection, being able to somehow measure distance was uh, quite good precision at about one meter, about like millimetric precision. And of course, like this kind of transversal precision is very good. That's what you saw in Kai. So that was my first idea was to make this kind of minority report thing because it was the year of minority report and it was fun. Not no markers, you know, the guy had markers. So I felt so good for, for a year. But uh, nobody knew <laughs> how this worked and now we have six cents with markers. But uh, I still think that it could be interesting to do something like this. Because not necessarily with galvanometers, but maybe with a Vixel arrays, with many arrays. Again, same idea. You are only interested in a short range interaction. So you can have like a lot of hairs, like exploring the, the world around and then measure the size of shape of your hand. It's basically a range, find, a, a range finder camera. People are now doing that. So yeah, we all could contribute a little part on this kind of reflection and then it's very quickly obsolete. This is another like application more inspired maybe on a, a Blade Runner. There's one moment uh, Harrison Ford is controlling, he's zooming on something by just talking and it's completely non-functional. He's saying like to the right 10.5 centimeter. I don't know how he knows, but no, it's like about like, like yeah, speech control interfaces. You are like, you know exactly how you want to do. It's not, doesn't work. You need painterly interfaces as Golan Levin says always, like something that is like more like an improvisation and you have a very fast feedback. So here is controlling like six degree of freedom with just one finger and no markers, zooming, doing some very simple like gesture recognition for zooming and de-zooming. Uh, so that was for machines. So I said like, yeah, you know, like having hairs. And uh, I don't know how much time and do I have, if I have time. So, uh, well, so you have a demo and uh, yeah. probably leave some time for you. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, the demo is, is just like, a, we can, uh, that doesn't need time, it's just press a button. So see, this is this system working without calibration on, on anything, like touching there, measuring, doing a local scan and giving a lot of information. That's the thing I was explaining, uh, it's not here today, to, uh, so doing, for instance, Mike. Mike. Uh, and then this is this is exactly shows my point about like perfect registration in time and space. This is a raster scan based system. Maybe you saw it. No, it was. It's, it's totally different technology. It's a MEMS based system, and uh, you have an infrared la laser and a red laser. So the red they are collinear. They are moving at the same time. When the infrared laser and one photo detector, when it senses a lot of absorption, in particular in the veins, absorbing infrared, then the, la the red laser is turned off in real time, per pixel. So you have a kind of end viewer. Now there's a company has made that by calibrating a projector and a laser and a, and a, and a camera, an infrared camera. But here, there's no like plane of calibration because they also always use homography, so I'm not sure they're calibrating the stuff because they have no marker. Here, it's impossible to lose it. So this is what I call like low level image processing on, on reality. So on, on the real world, you know, like counter, like enhancement and things like that. So you could have, I mean, maybe on your glasses, something like that, 
and enhance the contrast and things like that without needing to actually acquire the images and then project something. Someone who's not seeing very well could have this intelligent light that projects and somehow like prepare it was. So I will show this so I don't need to do that. So it's called light, it's an art installation that uses technology to perform, to make sound. So see, I'm moving the thing and it never like loses the tracking. When to, to make music, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not responsible for the, for the sound part, but it's just the first step. I, it, we, we're trying to create a kind of language of, of, a, of a, maybe related to the behavior of light. And we never really uh, finished this one. It's a uh, work in progress. But you see, it looks alive, and you can like play in real time. And uh, yeah, that's what I showed yeah, the at it ITS. So it was. I'm not sure it's possible to do now with camera and projector calibration. This it will be a little tricky because this really reacts instantly when it touches something. So it was just a kind of idea. It's really early stages. As you can see, I'm always projecting a little circle. It's not that interesting, but imagine if you can project like full graphics on your surface of your body. Make like, I don't know, some full battlefield on your body and control things and past I think it could be really interesting. I mean it's opened up so many possible uh, so yeah okay you'll see something like this now so I'm, I'm finishing it's almost over. So for vision based vision based like camera projector you have to calibrate that. This is a this is a, 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 a we were talking that yesterday that's why I put it here. It's a Camera projector calibration toolkit that I made for open frameworks, and you calibrate it in, in one minute. Camera and projector. So it's start like doing like this. It's an open CV. It's based on Kyle McDonald, this open framework community, and it's like an extension I made. So you do it like this, at the end, it's calibrated, and you start like doing augmented reality. Without a Kinect, of course, now we have Kinect, so you can do much more, but you can combine it. This is a normal camera and projector. And, um, Camera and projector doesn't mean that you don't have anything else. So here, this is a, I'm showing this because he sent me this yesterday. It's the latest version of the so-called book flipping scanning that is being developed in the lab. So here it uses some structural light, very fast cameras, a lot of processing, and it's scanning at 250 pages per, per minute a book. And when I say scanning, it's really having a, exactly the shape taking many pictures as the thing is moving, using shape from shading, knowing like you can't even measure the reflectance of the surface. So it's not just scanning and making it perfectly flat, but it's also that you're recording the reflectance of the book. So if one day you want to print it, you can even print it in the same material. <laughs> We're acquiring a lot of data. So it's a kind of cloner of books. Um, Wow. Okay. So now I reach one, the middle of my presentation. No. <laughs> uh, almost. Oh my. Okay. This is something I will talk maybe maybe with you later. This is what I'm working on. This idea of whole like collaborative 3D space. Uh, no. No more time. No. No. I will kill everybody. So I already explained this idea of the robots made of light. I've been like playing with that a lot, making this little beast that we show now. Oh, and uh, let me see. I think we're over. La I'm sorry, the last like slide. Oh, you wanted to see. Very silent. Yeah, there were many ideas. One is was actually shoot the shore some, somewhere in the Caribbean and project it in Finland, and then you make it. Yeah, and then the skiers somehow projected on the on the. <laughs> On the on the on the beach, but here it's completely simulated. Uh, it's a water line, so 
meta 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 balls yeah. people Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You were not scared of making everybody blind? No, <laughs> no, I did all the calculations. I was, see this, see this, see this guy. I was very serious about it. Not really. Uh, this is, this is what's maximum, maybe the maximum was 500 milliwatts because I was super concerned. And in fact, it's too conservative. Now people yeah, use laser like uh, five watts, something like that. It's, the important things are the optical parameters like divergence of the beam, et cetera, how it moves, et cetera. No, it's, it's safe. And they tried a much better light lighting. Okay, la last project. Um, last, sorry. The whole thing like points to the idea that we are now always playing with projectors and uh, you know, trying to make things appear in places that somehow uh, augment the meaning of the message that you are projecting, but it's always visual. So the idea will be to make something that's a function projector. You project on some surface or on some object some function. Here it was a very simple idea. Here it was like projecting sound through uh, this kind of parametric speaker on an on object like a banana that looks like a telephone, so you can talk on the phone, and really the sound comes from the banana. So the idea was to project function on objects. It's a multimodal display. Or you're having a some kind of pizza, and it becomes a video player, and you can like a He was my... Uh, Working with, with me as a student, I mean, not as a student, technical assistant in the lab for, for some years, we have a lot of fun. That was Laval Virtual, one of the winners last year. So, two years ago. So, this is our very cheap version of something like the Bimatron with sound. And uh, I think our, like, the, the motors were like uh, servo motors that were, were fried every three hours, something like that. <laughs> So I want to know how, what you've been using is much better. So, but you see, the idea I was thinking that, oh, things can be augmented from the outside. This is the extension of the concept of spatial augmented reality. It's not just spatial augmented reality with, sound, with images, with sound, maybe functions, maybe complete functions, which brings me to this last idea. Now I'm in the, in the, in the, uh, in the idea area, because it's the end of the talk. I've been, working on the book flipping scanning that you saw. And book, I mean, he was, this work, was working, and I also work on book flipping printing, trying to print a book in real time using photochromic inks. So you are like changing the affordances of, the ob of objects by projecting with this kind of extended projector from the outside. That means that, yeah, affordances become things that you can like switch it on and off on objects. So this is a kind of joke, you know, a hammer that could be rechargeable. But it's not so much a joke. When you buy a CD now, today, or you download some music, you are not allowed to copy into another computer or something like that, right? But you can, physically, you can. But you cannot because it's illegal. Same thing here. If you use it, it will be illegal. It's just be fined. So think about that. It could be, and maybe the, the hammer will become all completely like, uh, you know, doesn't work anymore. But if it breaks, it will be repaired for you because it's a service. You're paying the service. Same thing with everything. We're thinking that could be a strange dystopian or utopian future in which you don't owe things that have affordances. Someone else can control them. So that's why reflecting all this is matter. We can make a lot of mistakes and get trapped on things like that. And that's the end of my talk because, yeah. So I've been advocating this idea of reality center interface design, which I thought it was my idea, and of course has been like, like described like years ago with many like, uh, thinkers about this kind of uh, thing. So, and also this idea of real space of organizing scaffold for data versus this idea of the cloud that you don't know where it is. Well, in, in Seattle, you know where it is outside. <laughs> but in general, you know, I, I need some to place things somewhere uh, organize my data through space. And generalizing these uh, uh, rules of physics, as you were talking in your talk, like intuitive physics for trying to grasp things, you can't really because it's not really real objects, so you need to make something that makes sense, and 
I agree with you. And to date, I didn't see anything that makes sense. So completely, the closest is like what McGonigal was calling this kind of uh, uh, magic walls, in which, okay, you have maybe some, what call that, Harry Potter with a stick, a wand, and has some kind of power that does something. And then, okay, you know that you have something that has power, like a remote control, but it's too, too basic, you know? Uh, and I believe in very much in this, that the, you don't people put too much effort on making something that looks very nice and you press buttons and that's how you interact with the, you design the interface basically. And I think that even if you try to make it as simple as possible, intuitive, etc., you need to learn some kind of set of uh, rules that are uh, f fixed. Instead, if you have someone you modify the system as you interact. Well, people have probably tried that already. But really, it's like how people learn things in the real world. You interact with someone, you, inter you learn about the other by interacting. So trying to create uh, this physical agents, agents instead of knobs that have a behavior, that are little animals and can uh, communicate with them and train them my interface. That was about one hour and 20 minutes. Much more than I expect, I'm sorry. Thank you. Any quick questions? Well, I'm curious about that banana. So there's no speakers inside the banana. No. It's using special sound. How can you be... See this, see this. People are leaving, I have to make it work. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Wow. My hands. Yeah, I can. I need to See, yeah, here, there, I put it there. <laughs> ah, but now. Oh, that's my favorite. I'm singing very well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Can I hold up the t-shirt? Oh, yeah, please, please, you can put it. <laughs> <laughs> so here it's not a game, it's just, I'm just showing some really simple. So you can move, there's no calibration, so. Maybe the bigger. Okay. Fine. So it can bounce. It can mean many things. This. Is Tom, what if you don't make it flat? Don't make it. You make it mm? uh, uh, arbitrary surface. Okay. Yeah. Well, it has well, to be well. on the line of sight of the. Oh, okay. Is this, is this I just like to break things. Is this, is this what you're looking for? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, but it will. Well, it cannot work because I'm projecting from here. But yesterday we were talking about some solutions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 What were the uh, ping pong balls for? Yeah, ping pong balls. The ping pong balls is because I modified the code to, to be able to do tracking, so you can really throw. In the is that working with this device? I hope so, but. Yeah, I didn't modify it. Okay. Let's throw it. <laughs> so what is, what is this device here? This is a, an avalanche photo detector. It's detecting how much light come reflects on the object. And that's it. That's the only information you have. And now each little circle contains about like 20 points. It's made about 2 milliseconds. So it's turning. It's a kind of very fast local scan. So the power of the was? He came back. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I did it. <laughs> I, I, will, yeah, I will show you. Yeah, I, will, I will change the mode. I don't so believe it. There's the feed. You can only see it once. <laughs>